Hare Krishna. So we'll uh, do one bhajan before we begin the class. And this is known as Sri Nam Kirtan, also known as Yasomati Nandana. Yasumati Nandana Braja Varan Hagara Gokula Hanjana Kahana Yasumati Nandana Rajabharam Nagara Gokuran Jana Ha 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 Nandana Madama no Hara Kali Adamana Vidhana Kali Adamana Vidhana Hamala Hari Ram, Hamia Vila Saham. Hamala Hari Ram, Hamia Vila Saham. Hippina Porandara, Havina Nagara Bada, Vamsi Vadan Hasu, Hey, Prajajana Falana, Sudakulana Sana. Prajajana Falana, Sudakulana Sana. Randa Gurana Koha. Nanda go dana rakko ha 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 Go vinda madhava navanita tas kada go Go vinda madhava navanita tas kada go Sundaran handa go ha 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 Sundaran and her go Hey, Jamuna Tata Chad, go keep a son no harder. Jamuna Rasara Sikha Kripa Mohaya Hey, see you out of Bala, Vindavana, not the Bala, see you out of Bala, Vindavana, not the Bala, see you out of Bala, Vindavana, not the Bala, see you Bhakti Vinoda Sahaya Sila Bhakti Vinoda Sahaya Hey, Hasomati Nandana Pajavara Nagara Gokula Nandana Sahaya Nandana Hey, Hamala Hari Nam, 
रमिय विलास विधीन पुरंदर नवीन न गर बार गोविंद माधव नवनीत झामुन तत् गोपी वनोहर हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृत कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृत कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे श्रीआर वल्लभ वृंदवान नथ भर हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो गरि भो मे थाय घोर हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो राधा वृंदावन चंद्र राधा वृंदावन चंद्र हरे हम जाय राधा कुंज बिहारी राधा कुंज बिहारी हरे जय राधा माधव राधा माधव राधा हे हे जय राधा मदन मोह राधा मदन मोह हे हे जय राधा गोविंद राधा गोविंद हे हे जय राधा गोपीना राधा गोपीना राधा हे जय राधे 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 जय श्री राधे हम जय राधे 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 जाय श्री राधे हम प्रभु भाज प्रभु भाज प्रभु भाज जाय प्रभु भाज जाय जाय प्रभु भाज प्रभु भाज प्रभु भाज प्रभु भाज जय जय प्रभु भाज नी थाय घोर हरि भो हरे भो हरे भो घोर हरे भो हरि भो हरि भो गौर हरि भो यशोमति नंदन ब्रज बार नागर गोकुल रंजन Kana, can I, Krishna? So that's a beautiful bhajan by Shila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, describing Krishna's pastimes in the form of all of his various transcendental names. It's uh, when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj was departing the world. And they were singing bhajans, 
and uh, he asked specifically for two bhajans to be sung. And both of them were his, he might say, his favorite. And one was Yasamati Nandana. So he loved that bhajan very much. And we can see it's just, it's just one beautiful name of Krishna after another describing all of his wonderful leelas in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And the other song that he also loved very much is Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, glorification of Sri Rupa Goswami. So, so we should sing these bhajans regularly. The bhajans by the great acharyas are on the highest level of spiritual uh, expression because they glorify the Lord in such a deep and one devotional way. The prayers by Naratam Das Thakur, the prayers by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Lochan Das Thakur, and many, many other others. When Srila Prabhupada was asked by his very dear devotee, Jamuna, was one of the first ladies who had joined the ISKCON movement in New York in 1965, 1966 actually. What is your favorite bhajan? Prabhupada responded, hmm. can't think of it now. <laughs> remember if somebody can remember it, it is, huh? Hari Hari, Vipale Janama Gonainu, Manusana Janma Paya, Radha Krishna Nababdiya, Janiya Sunya Visainu. Prabhupada loved that bhanja because it's deep in the emotion of separation from Radha Krishna and it's full of danya. So much humility that the spiritual master expresses for his love for Radha and Krishna. So I'm going to speak a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, about one particular bhajan that I find. I can introduce myself, that's okay. <laughs> My name is Swam <laughs> Swamiji. Okay. <laughs> Hare Krishna. I'm timing you now. Two minutes. Two minutes. At the clock here. We are very blessed to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj amongst us. Born in New Jersey, USA in 1947, Maharaj came in touch with this con in Denver, Colorado, when he was just a young boy of 24. And subsequently he began serving at New Vrindavan Farm community in West Virginia. And he was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in 1973. In 1986, he accepted sannyas and began preaching in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. And from early 1990, he took a specific direction in uh, involving in preaching in ISKCON prison ministries in America. He started visiting the inmates and holding programs, writing letters to the inmates and sending them Srila Prabhupada's books regularly. And he developed it into a very big preaching in America to such an extent that he has even made an extensive compilation of how many prison inmates have turned into devotees. Mm -hmm. He's written a book called the Holy Jail, a touching compilation of the activities of ISKCON prison ministry. That's one of his very prominent contributions. And 1995, he began serving as a resident sannyasi in Chicago. And since then, Maharaj has been making Chicago as his place of residence whenever he goes to West. Now he preaches in various parts of the world, like America, India, Western Europe, Slovenia, Croatia, Italy, and UK. Maharaj is also an initiating spiritual master within ISKCON society. And uh, I was very fortunate to get his association since 1991 when I uh, came to the Chopari temple. I always seen him along with his Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj, both of them together, giving several uh, lectures, kathas. Many times, Parampuji Radhanath Maharaj would uh, asked Chandramani Maharaj to speak an entire Chaitanya Leela. Uh, Maharaj, Radhanath Swami Maharaj would speak like one hour or two hours and then the next two hours he will ask him to speak. And they both would actually narrate Chaitanya Leela very beautifully. Also he has uh, spoken to all of us in Yatras and uh, 
uh, Pune Yatra also. Mm -hmm. And he answers questions very beautifully. And uh, he has been a very a great youth preacher in Pune also. Maharaj would come to Pune regularly, sometimes once or twice a year. And he has addressed our youth on various topics like mind management or what is real happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he has very, very powerful examples to uh, smash illusion to dust. Mm -hmm. Very beautifully he presents. So, he also travels within uh, India to various places like uh, Belgaum, Kolapur, Nastik and Goa, many places he goes and uh, he travels for two to three days and he gives lectures. And uh, one of the qualities that I love the most in him is, is utter humility and complete non-enviousness uh, towards his God brothers. And he is very, uh, he heartily appreciates all his God brothers and has great reverence for the Vaishnava Association. Another famous thing which I don't have to tell all of you is his very beautiful dance. Uh, and he, from Rajanath Maharaj would always call him to stage to dance. <laughs> his dancing is so vibrant, it reminds us of how the dance must have been some 500 years ago at Shiva Sangan. So, thanks to Vizwana Chandramali Swami for his very powerful uh, role model and example uh, by which he is inspiring all of us. Let us welcome him to Shri Radha and Damachandra Temple. Hari Bo! Hari Shyam Prabhu Ki! Ki! Om Vigyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadati Svapadantikam Pande Ham Shigurom Shiyuta Padakamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sarvadutam Parijana Sita Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Dr. Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Krishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Vancha Kalpa Taru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Pae Bhaja Titanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namo Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamene Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravari Pacharine Nirvisesha Sunyavari Pasyatya Dei Satarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Nda Shri Advaita Vedadhar Shivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama Rama So this beautiful bhajan, Shivai, uh, the author is Naratam Das Thakur, also known as Shri Guru Charana Padma. We just, we sing this bhajan every day in order to glorify the spiritual master. When Prabhupada began the movement in the Western world, he understood clearly that the Western mindset and his students, who are also coming from that mindset, didn't know really anything about a spiritual master. <laughs> how to behave with a spiritual master, how to uh, you know, worship a spiritual master. In fact, there's one little story that was written by my godbrother, um, Mukunda Maharaj, when he wrote his book about Prabhupada in the early days, he describes one situation which kind of illustrates how much we knew about a spiritual master. And Prabhupada was with Mukunda, and uh, they were together in a car, and uh, Prabhupada 
had a date, you know, one of these dried fruit dates. So Prabhupada bit the date, and then he gave it to Mukunda. And Mukunda was thinking, hmm, I'm supposed to eat that after somebody bit on it? But then he thought, the problem was, yeah. So he, take a, he took a bite of it, and then he gave it back to Prabhupada. <laughs> like it's your turn now. <laughs> so that's, um, that's one little story about how much we knew about a spiritual master. <laughs> it wasn't easy for us to really digest the whole idea of guru worship. And so Prabhupada did something that was kind of revolutionary in the sense that he wanted to help us understand deeper what it meant to worship the spiritual master and what is a spiritual master and who is a spiritual master. So taking this song by Srila Naratam Das Thakur, this beautiful bhajan, and which is actually in glorification of his spiritual master, Lokanath Das Goswami. Prabhupada initiated that bhajan every day in our temple worship. It wasn't done before. The guru was only worshipped on his appearance day. And so Prabhupada sta established every day official guru worship. So some people might think, well, maybe he's a little proud, he wants worship. But actually, Prabhupada took the uh, risk of being criticized just so he could help his devotees understand what it meant to be a disciple, what is a guru, what is the worship of a guru, and what are the intricate aspects of that guru worship, which is nicely illustrated by this song. And that helped every day to help us to come to that understanding of Srila Prabhupada's position. <laughs> so I'll read some of the lines and then I'm going to try in whatever way I can to try to explain what this song means. Srila Naratam Das Thakur's writings, his songs and his writings, are being glorified as the Siddhanta of Bhakti Yoga. In other words, not only does he write, but he writes with the conclusion. And what is the conclusion of all activities in devotional service? So his, his bhajans are Shastra, <laughs> non different than Shastra. Actually Shastra itself. So this one we sing, Shri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sadma Bando Mui Sarvadana Mate. The lotus feet of the spiritual master are the only which we can attain pure devotional service. I bow down to his lotus feet with great awe and reverence. Lotus feet, uh, what we say, indicates devotional service. And the lotus feet of the pure devotee indicates pure devotional service. So his lotus feet actually are the indication where the disciple puts his concentration. We approach a spiritual person by approaching first through the feet. The feet indicate humility, and also devotion to that personality. So Charana Padma, of course Charana means feet, and Padma means lotus. So what is the quality of a lotus? A lotus is very beautiful, it's very fragrant, and it's very rare. <laughs> and it also is something that is not touched by the material energy. There's one bhajan, Chapala Sukala Mahile, is that if you put a, some water on a lotus leaf, immediately the water flies off. The waxing coating is automatic there on the lotus leaf. So therefore, 
when a when a lotus comes out of the water, it's completely dry because it doesn't touch the water because of that coating. So in the same way, the spiritual master and his lotus feet don't touch this material world. There's a nice pastime with, again, with Jamuna and Srila Prabhupada. This was in London in 1970 when Prabhupada started to preach in London. And he was at John Lendon's estate called Tittenhurst, and Prabhupada was, stayed there for one month. He took the opportunity to write and to also preach in the area. So John Lennon offered his estate and gave him one building for his own comforts. So Prabhupada, since 1967, 68 actually, was doing his morning walk every day. Prabhupada said, my morning walk and my massage gave me 10 more years of life. <laughs> Prabhupada had three heart attacks and after the third heart attack, he was told by the doctor, he has to exercise. <laughs> and Prabhupada took it seriously, but he turned it into something spiritual and he used it for an opportunity to speak to the devotees and that became the famous morning walk conversations. We all hear some of those amazing discussions with Srila Prabhupada about topics that are most amazing and most interesting. Now, Prabhupada was taking walks occasionally, not every day with Jamuna, and it was just the two of them. Just Prabhupada and his disciple Jamuna. And so they were walking through the the forests and the areas, and the area was sometimes a little muddy. So one time, Prabhupada was walking, and Jamuna was walking alongside of him, and Prabhupada would speak to her. She was, she had so much love for Prabhupada, and Prabhupada could understand it, and she was completely surrendered in her devotional service. So in one sense, Prabhupada gave her a lot of special attention and mercy. So on this morning walk, she was thinking, I shouldn't walk alongside of Prabhupada, I should walk behind him. So she walked behind Prabhupada and she was thinking, I'm going to walk in his footsteps. When, I, when he touches the ground, I'm going to touch the ground in the same place. <laughs> and this was her mindset. So Prabhupada is walking and she's following behind. But after some time she notices, I can't see his footprints. I'm walking, I see mine, but I can't see his. And this went on and then she thought, I have to ask Prabhupada. Prabhupada, I'm trying to walk in your footsteps, but there's no footprints. There's no footsteps. How is that? She, Prabhupada said, that will be revealed later. <laughs> Some devotees say, and this is actually, they say when Prabhupada walked, sometimes he never touched the ground. <laughs> so we can understand the personality of Prabhupada. He was not just a great saint. He was a intimate associate of Lord Sri Krishna from the spiritual world who came to do this work. So his lotus feet are like lo uh, his feet are like lotuses, which carry everything of beauty, knowledge, and devotion. So therefore, Narottam Das so of course says, "Kevala Bhakti," that is the highest form of bhakti, can be found at the lotus feet of the spiritual master. Then he says, Bandho Mui Swapadana Mate. I bow down to those lotus feet with great awe and reverence. So Prabhupada speaks about this particular line. He says, this line means no hatchet. Hatchet. So you know what a hatchet is? A hatchet is an axe for cutting wood. So when you're cutting wood, you go down fast and bring it up fast. <laughs> Choo -choo. Choo -choo. Like that. So, 
bow down to the lotus feet, Prabhupada said, no hatchet. So sometimes we see devotees, they go down and they sometimes they touch the floor, but, but they don't want to stay there more than two seconds. So they come back up real fast. Prabhupada said, that is not obeisances. Obeisances means with great feeling and devotion and chanting the prayer offered to the spiritual master. That is obeisances. So when Prabhupada was in his room and his devotees would come in to do seva, in order to teach again, Prabhupada would request them to offer obeisances coming in and going out. And if he saw them doing the hatchet program, he would say, that is not obeisances. So we can learn from that all. Because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, manmana bhava mad bhakto mam yaji mam namaskuru, that offer your obeisances is one of the four principal activities of a devotee and devotional service. How important it is to offer obeisances, but how to do it in the right way that we actually are doing obeisances and not just doing some yoga exercise. <laughs> so it has to be done in that mood. And then one will understand, ah, this is really wonderful. When one does it in that mood of humility and chanting the prayers of the spiritual master, and with great attention, then that is actually obeisance. The tendency is to get a little routine after a while. And sometimes we're in a hurry, <laughs> but that doesn't work. <clears throat> then the rest of the prayer says, by his grace, one can cross the ocean of material suffering and attain the mercy of Krishna. So no one can approach Krishna unless one approaches the bona fide spiritual master. Although the living entity has a direct relationship with Krishna in devotion, because of our fallen condition in the material energy, that, that relationship has been obscured and covered by this material energy. And therefore, in order to revive that relationship, one has to take full shelter of Krishna's representative. And by his mercy. Now he says, this ocean, this material world is like an ocean. So who can swim across the ocean? Not possible. Prabhupada, see, even if you're an Olympic swimmer, and you have won so many gold medals for swimming, you cannot swim across an ocean. It is not possible. And so, this material world is like an ocean. There are so many, many sharks, dangerous fishes, wild waves, and it's very extensive. One time, one devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I've been practicing Krishna consciousness for one year. I don't have love of God. What's wrong? Prabhupada said, oh, one year. Hmm. How long you've been in the material world? Mitche maya ravese kachuha bubu bubai chief Krishna das, hey Vishwash. Life after life after life, and practically all eight million species of life, the living entity has traversed, being associated with this material energy in different bodies and in different activities. So this compounding of this material energy, that's why sometimes it says that the, nitya, the, li the living entity is called Nitya Bada. Bada means condition and Nitya means eternal. Is it a fact that we are eternally conditioned? The, ta the, the label is used for the jiva in, in the material world. We are not eternally conditioned, but the, the label is giving you an indication that you are so much associated with this material energy that it's been so long that you cannot even trace out when you first came in contact with the material energy. Life after life after life after life. Koti. Millions and millions of lifetimes. And to get a human form of life, 
very rare, very rare. I was just reading in the Garuda Purana, it was describing how rare it is for the living entity to get the human form of life and how sad it is, how lamentable it is, is to use, not use that human form of life for self-realization. It is probably, it's like someone gives you a whole container of pure gold and you use it simply to sit on. In other words, not understanding the value of the human form of life, the, the living entity wastes it simply trying to find happiness where there's no happiness in this material world. Now the human form of life is rare, very rare. And Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth canto says, and to take birth in Bhardvarsya, in India, it specifically mentions in India, is a very, very rare birth extremely rare compared to other births in other places around the world. That's why it says anyone who takes birth in India, pretty much, they are pretty much finished with the material energy. Please don't go back. <laughs> because the river flows in two directions. <laughs> it flows towards the spiritual world and it also flows away from the spiritual world. So if we take the wrong river, we can again be caught within this whirlpool of material suffering, which means trying to squeeze out a little bit of happiness through the senses, mind and the intelligence, where there's an unlimited ocean, an anandam buddhi vardhanam, an unlimited ocean of happiness in our relationship with Krishna. In that prayer by Lord Chaitanya, it is described by, by Bhakti Vinod Thakur and by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati that this term Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam is very interesting. It says that the jiva is limited. The word jiva means limited, but the happiness that the jiva can experience is unlimited. In other words, your happiness has no limit, although you as a jiva are categorized as limited. Because in relationship to the Supreme Soul, Krishna, you connect with that and his limited happiness is unlimited, therefore you share in that unlimited happiness. Prabhupada used the example, again, with an ocean. He says that, he says, Krishna consciousness is like an ocean. Once you get in it, you can swim forever and never reach the shore. It is unlimitedly pure, unlimitedly full of knowledge and unlimitedly full of happiness. This is bhakti yoga given by the great souls. So to cross this ocean of material existence, one has to have a good boat and one has to have a good captain, favorable winds, and so the boat is devotional service. The favorable winds is following the rules and regulations given by the Shastras. And the captain is the spiritual master. Please don't jump ship. <laughs> Stay on board. Sometimes in the ship of the, the uh, Bhakti Yoga, there's some waves and it gets a little rough sometimes. And we think, oh, Maybe I should just get out, but all you can go to is the water all around you. There's no islands. So if you get out, you'll simply drown. Stay in the rocky boat, and then after a while, by the power of the captain and by your determination to get across, chanting the holy names of the Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare you come to the final conclusions here, which is says, one can obtain the mercy of Krishna. And Prabhupada says, the shelter of Krishna. In other words, the spiritual master, he takes you to Krishna, directly, not indirectly. The second prayer, Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chitete Koriya Oikya, Ana Koriya Vanayas. My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. 
attachment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all desires. Prabhupada explains this particular verse means that I want to hear more and more the words of my spiritual master. This is my nourishment, this is my food, this is my substance. By hearing more and more the words of my spiritual master, I'm becoming more and more free from the attachments of material life and I'm developing more and more attraction to Krishna. My consciousness is becoming purified. This word, these words are my nourishment, my foodstuffs. If I don't get this daily, regularly, then I will simply shrivel up and die. So therefore I must hear every day the words of my spiritual master. And through that hearing, one becomes attached. What is that attachment? I want to hear more and more. People sometimes ask me a question, how do you become Krishna conscious? What is the secret? I said, just hear. Hear over and out. Hear as much as possible. The words of Shastra coming through Guru. Hear about Krishna. Hear about the process of devotional service. Become attached to the process of hearing. We have on our example in our Shastras, Parikshit Maharaj. He had seven days to live. He didn't go around trying to buy a new house or, uh, you know, re fixing his crashed computer. No, he was, he, all he wanted to do was hear. He came down to the banks of the Jamuna River and he just sat there waiting to give up his life praying that he would receive the mercy of the Lord. And the Lord sent his mercy in the form of Sukadev Goswami. And of course, other sages and saints also came, but Sukadev Goswami was the one that was qualified to speak. And he spoke for seven days the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. And Pariksit Maharaj simply heard. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep. After nine cantos of narration, Sukadev Goswami said to Maharaj Pariksit, do you want some break? Do you want a, a little water? He said, now you are speaking 10th canto. This is what I'm waiting for. Huh? Please continue. So he was more eager to hear at that point because now he was about the narrations of Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham. So, and of course, at the end of hearing, the, for seven full days, he became fully self-realized. He lost all fear. Although he was to die in a very nice, not such nice way, he had to be bitten by a poisonous snake. He accepted it as Krishna's arrangement and was happy to leave the world and knowing that he would go back to the spiritual world. That's through the process of hearing. So this is where our attachment comes. We want to get attached to the process of devotional service. We want to get attached to the spiritual master. We want to get attached to the Lord. We have to hear. Taking darshan, seeing, is nice and it's important. But hearing is more important. Because hearing goes right directly to the soul and awakens attachment and devotion to the Supreme Lord. That's why sometimes we say, God has given you one mouth and two ears. <laughs> so hearing, it's important to speak, but it's more important to hear. <laughs> and especially for those who like to speak, when you master the art of hearing, then you can speak. For those who are eager to speak, they should also be twice as eager to hear then the process of speaking becomes what we say important and what we say beneficial. So this is, the, this is how we become attached more and more to the spiritual master, by hearing his words, Guru Vakya. We want that more and more. So this is the second verse. And then it goes on to explain. Second part of the Shigaru Charane Rate, so this means attachment to the lotus feet of the spiritual master, everything is there. 
Prabhupada explains that this verse means that I may want this, I may need this, I may have to endeavor to get this, forget it. Just become more and more attached to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and it fulfills all of one's desires. How do you fulfill a desire? Two ways. You get what you want or you give up the desire. <laughs> Both ways are good. Getting what you want, okay. But when you get a higher taste, when you get the taste that comes from spiritual practice, then you can immediately give up those tastes that are not very, what we say, palatable, material desires. Fulfilling all one's desires are also there in worshiping the spiritual master. And Prabhupada writes that. He says devotees don't understand that if they, the more the more they absorb themselves in devotional service, the more Krishna arranges for everything they need and more. Not only does Krishna give you what you need, he gives you more. <laughs> and then you might say, well, he's not giving me that. That means you didn't need it. <laughs> Certain things you think you need, that may be something different than what Krishna thinks is good for you. But he always gives you what you need to become happy and to live healthy life in this world. Healthy life. Krishna also arranges that to take care of his devotees so they get the maximum amount of care both in their body and mind. If you have that faith, it works. And Krishna automatically takes, arranges everything through the spiritual master's mercy. Because when the spiritual master is pleased, then everything else comes automatically. <clears throat> Do we have that faith? It's something that we sh should work for. <laughs> the next verse, Yes. Chakudan Dilo Ye Janmi Janmi Prabhu Se Divigyan Ridde Prakasito. So sometimes Prabhupada would say Chakudan Dilo Ye Janmi Jami Pita Se. Pita means father. <laughs> so spiritual master is the actual father and uh, so sometimes he, he changes that around just to give us an indicator. So he opens my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. Divigyan ride prakasito. And he gives me, yeah, he gives me transcendental knowledge. So Prabhupada says, yes, this is the spiritual master. He not only opens the eyes, he forces open the eyes. You want to stay asleep? Jeep jargo, jeep jargo. Wake up, wake up, wake up to the reality of your existence. You're not this body, you belong to Krishna. So this is what that verse means. Dib gyan. Dibya means transcendental and gyan means knowledge. What is that dibya gyan that he's giving you? And Prabhupada explains that dib gyan in this context means you are Krishna's. You belong to Krishna, that is your only identity. You, you, uh, you have no other identity than being Krishna's part and parcel. That is who you are. We have so many designations in this material world. We, and we have so many activities that give us different labels based on our positions in this world, our relations with other living entities, or our own labels that we attach to ourselves. But these are all coming by way of the association of the material energy. And so they have some purpose, but ultimately they are not us and they are all temporary. Our real identity is that we are, we belong to Krishna. <laughs> and we belong to Krishna. When we know that, then everything else becomes easy. Because everything belongs to Krishna. <laughs> not only us, but all, every, all the energies are also. So this verse is very instructive. Divigyan ride prakasito. And I don't mind if I have to take birth janmani janmani. He becomes my spiritual master, is my father, my guide, my well-wisher, my direct connection with Krishna, life after life after life. Even if I have to come back, 
Let me be his disciple life after life after life. <laughs> okay. So, Prema Bhakti, Jaha Hoite, Advidya, Vinasa, Yarti, Vedagai, Janhara, Charito. Prema Bhakti, he can give you love of God. Just like that. <laughs> it's, you might think, how is that possible? If he wants to, he has that power. He has love of God, and he controls Krishna by his love of God. So if he says, Krishna, give this person love of God, Krishna does it. <laughs> Krishna is very inclined to satisfy. So therefore, if we want the mercy of Krishna, we get the mercy of Guru, because Guru Krishna's mercy is actually Guru's mercy. Like that. So love of God is there. Just like we understand from the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sometimes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would immediately give someone love of God. Just immediately. Well, because he was pleased with them and he would bless them with love of God. Just like that. He did that with Kolavetra Sridhar. He did that with so many of his devotees. And simply by glancing at him in a loving way, they were experiencing love of God. That was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So the spiritual master is the representative of Gaur Nittai, especially Lord Nityananda. And who is who's the most merciful manifestation of God? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he asked. But who's distributing that mercy? Nittai, Nityananda. So actually the spiritual master is the manifestation of the complete mercy of the Supreme Lord coming through the process of bhakti given by Gaur Nittai. Sometimes we think, well, I like Krishna, but who's this Gaur Nittai? Why do these guys are on the altar? You know, we just, we just need Radha and Krishna, right? <laughs> People think like that too. But in this age, you can't approach Radha and Krishna unless you approach Radha and Krishna through the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu coming through Lord Nityananda, whose representative is the spiritual master Srila Prabhupada and his, those who, who have taken full shelter of Srila Prabhupada. So the process is going to Krishna through these great personalities. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's process is to chant the holy names of the Lord and to worship the Lord according to the teachings of Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita and in Srimad Bhagavatam. That's what Mahaprabhu is actually teaching. So we take shelter of Lord Nityananda and he, we take full shelter of his representative, the spiritual master. And then it says, Prema Bhakti Yoho Hoiti, Avi Avi Nasayoiti. He can destroy all ignorance, all material desires. One devotee came to Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I have so many, there's so many obstacles in my devotional service. I'm having a difficult time. Prabhupada, you said, you come to me by my boot, one kick, finished. <laughs> He wasn't just making some nice words. He was actually saying, by the power of the Guru, if you take full shelter of the spiritual master, by his mercy, he can immediately destroy obstacles. i give you an example. I was... Uh, sometimes people approach me and they have problems with ghosts. <laughs> Ma, Maharaj is this ghost that's constantly bothering me. So, you know, we usually tell him to chant, you know, Namaste, Narasringhaya, like that. So, she was coming to me and I said, you know, you know take shelter of Lord Narasringhadev, he's really powerful. She said, she came back, she said, I'm chanting Narasringhadev, but the ghost is still there. So, uh, I didn't know what to say. So I said, well, take shelter of Krishna. <laughs> so she tried that, didn't work. <laughs> she came back, the ghost was, I said, all right. Try Prabhupada. <laughs> yeah. 
So she, she started chanting Prabhupada's name, worshipping Prabhupada. She said, ghost is gone. <laughs> True, it's true story. Yeah. And we can understand that the supreme mercy is manifested through the pure devotee Srila Prabhupada. So we shouldn't minimize Prabhupada's position. We should understand that he is personally present and there for his devotees. Taking shelter for him, he can give us the means to attain pure bhakti, and he can also destroy all these obstacles that are blockages in our path of devotional service. And then it says, Vedigahiyana Racharito, that through all the scriptures the spiritual master is glorified as the pure representative of, this, of the Lord. No one can approach the Supreme Lord unless they approach the Lord through him. So one who glorifies the spiritual master is actually performing the highest service because Krishna thinks in such a way as that if you worship me that's nice but if you worship my pure devotee that's better. <laughs> Prabhupada used the example if there's a big man he has all money he has all wealth riches influence so you try to give him something but what can you give him he has everything. <laughs> He may accept your offering as an appreciation for the offering, but he doesn't need it. But if you give something to his little child, say you give a little lollipop or some candy to his son, because he loves his son so much, he thinks, oh, this person is so nice. He, he, he gave something to my son and my son is so happy. So when you please someone that loves Krishna, that's better than pleasing Krishna directly. <laughs> so therefore, when we please the spiritual master, that is actually a higher form of worshiping than worshiping Krishna. Why? Because Krishna actually becomes more happy when, they, when, he, when we praise and glorify and worship and follow his, his representative, the pure spiritual master. So all the Shastras glorify the, the spiritual master. There's a beautiful set of prayers from the Skanda Purana spoken by Lord Shiva, in which one verse, he's speaking, he's speaking to Parvati, and he's glorifying the, spirit, the pure devotee spiritual master. Those prayers are so deep in devotion, describing how what is the position of a spiritual master, a pure spiritual master, and how glorifiable it is for those who worship that spiritual master. They also become glorifiable. So that's a beautiful set of prayers by Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is glorifying the pure spiritual master. I can't remember all of the prayers, but each one goes into the details of the mercy of the spiritual master and how he manifests that mercy into the heart of his uh, enthusiastic disciple. Shiguru Shri Guru Karuna Sindhu Aramajan Janarabandhu So he is an ocean of mercy and he is the friend of all living entities. So Krishna is called Surhit there are three kinds of friends, Mitra, Bandhu, and Suhit. I think Bandhu is like official friend or casual friend. Uh, Mitra is like a f official friend, but Suhit refers to Krishna. He is the real friend. What is that verse? Bhaktaram Yagya Tapasam Sarvaloka Maheshraha Suhiram Sarvabhutanam Yantamam Yantrishrishtati Krishna is the friend of all living entities. Why? Because he knows what you need and he is eager to give it to you. So therefore a friend knows what the, their friend needs and always makes a friend uh, arrangements to please that friend. So the spiritual master, he's the representative of our best friend, Sri Krishna. So he's a friend of all living entities. 
he has no personal motivation for himself. He's only trying to give Krishna to others. Lokanath Lokira Jivan, so Narutam Das Tukur, is saying that my spiritual master, he is my life, he is my, he is my only shelter. Haha Prabhu Kora Doya Deha Moda Parachaya. This verse is interesting. We sing that with such feeling. It says, it says here, be merciful unto me. Give me the shade of your lotus feet. What is the last line here? Ebi Yasa Gusi Tribhuvan. Your fame is spread all over the three worlds. This verse is interesting. The spiritual master is merciful, but still, this verse is telling you, cry for that mercy, pray for that mercy, beg for that mercy. You're merciful, I know that, but still, I'm crying for it, I'm begging for it, I want it. That eagerness in the expression of devotion brings that mercy fast. <laughs> The more eager you are for the mercy, the mercy is always available. Just like air is available for everyone. But one who is, you know, not able to breathe so easily, when they get air, how much they appreciate that? <laughs> Just like if you go underwater for a little while and then you come up, air becomes really valuable. <laughs> so in the same way, although the mercy is available, we when we pray for it and beg for it, this is what this, this line in this prayer is saying, then we can expect that it falls very fast. Mm -hmm. So that eagerness must be there. Abhyasa Gusik Tri Bhuvan. There's nobody more glorifiable than this pure spiritual master. And now this is what we want to do also as a society. We want to spread the glories of Srila Prabhupada all around the world. And now we see that just recently Yadubar Prabhu has, uh, along with his good wife, Mother Vishaka and a team of uh, professionals and others have put together this beautiful movie glorifying Srila Prabhupada and explaining the early days of Krishna consciousness. <coughs> I remember when I first went to see the movie in Chicago in one local theater, when I came out, one lady came up to me and said, oh, I saw you in the movie. I said, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> Somebody looked like me. So then we were talking. She said, you know, I came. She said, I really like that. I learned a lot. Your teacher really was really a wonderful person. He did so much. Before I came here, my friends and relatives were saying, why are you going there? You don't want to go there. But somehow or other, I felt like I should go and see this movie. So she came and she was so happy after seeing the movie and then she took a card and then I gave her some contact with the temple. And of course that was the last thing I saw of her, but still, she had a nice experience not knowing anything about Krishna consciousness or Prabhupada. She just decided to see this movie. And all of a sudden, now she's attracted. So the life of Srila Prabhupada is now being glorified, I mean, splendidly, in the most amazing way, uh, propagated through these, this particular movie of, about Srila Prabhupada. And I was speaking to Yadabhar, he was telling me this movie is you can, the highest rating you can get in the movie industry is 10 points. We have got 9.5 for this movie. It's a very <laughs> nice. And so it's becoming more and more distributed everywhere around the world and more and more people are re hearing and seeing this movie and there's a lot of what we say responses coming in from people and appreciating what we I showed it and we showed it in one prison too in two prisons we showed it in one prison we showed it uh, there's a group of about nine inmates who have a regular program on the day of the movie 
60 inmates showed up for the movie. <laughs> and they had no idea what is Krishna consciousness or anything. They just wanted to come and see a movie, you know. Because <laughs> when you're in jail, you, you, know, you look for some entertainment, you know, something to do. So they had the option of going. They took it and they came. And later on, they were telling the other inmates who were practicing, your teacher is really far out, you know. He's really a pretty amazing personality, you know. They use other words, you know, because, you know, this is j jail jargon is a little different than what we would like to speak in public here. <laughs> but they were appreciating, you know, Prabhupada and appreciating the Hare Krishna movie. And based on that, um, a few more of the inmates started to attend the regular programs in the jail. So this movie is going everywhere and showing the world because people like the visual. The visual arts have become so popular now that through the visual, people have been learning and getting more and more information about everything. So we've used this, uh, what we say, media to somehow or other bring the teachings of Srila Prabhupada and the personality of Prabhupada to the lives. We can, go, we can get much more from uh, singing these prayers than just by singing it without knowing the meaning. Okay, so I'll stop here. Do we have time for questions? Or any questions? <clears throat> yes, there's a question here. In, uh, often in scriptures two things are told, Jnana and Vijnana. So you told simply by hearing uh, attachment will come to Lord, uh, spiritual master. So I want to ask how Vijnana will happen uh, simply by hearing? By continuous hearing. <laughs> by hearing the same message over and over again, you'll eventually reach Vijnana through, through the hearing process. If you're hearing with rapt attention. As Prabhupada said, with rapt attention one has to hear. That means fixed, say you're fixed on the words that are being said. Personal experience I had, I was listening, I've been, you know, I usually listen to Prabhupada's lecture, so one day I was listening to Prabhupada's lecture and Prabhupada says, you should know you're not this body. You know, how many times did I hear that? hundreds of times, read it so many times. But when I heard it this one time, all of a sudden I got it. Yeah, that's it. So what, what am I saying is that you can hear something and you can accept the words, but there's something called intuitive knowledge. So when you hear something and it goes deep, and it registers not only on the level of the mind, but on the level of the intelligence and on the level of the soul. It awakens your realization of what you are hearing. So that works with transcendental knowledge. So when you hear continuously, regularly, and with the proper mood, proper attention, you can actually reach Vigya. That's what happened to Maharaj Pariksit. Yeah, it works, but it, it depends how much covered you are. The more covering you are, the more you have to hear. <laughs> Another question back there somewhere? Yes. Hello, uh, Prabhuji, can you please explain the metaphor that you used uh, to explain uh, the boat, the captain and the river? Can you please re-explain that again? I want to hear that again. Yeah, the material energy is impossible to cross. Crossing means getting over it and, and getting beyond it and going to the spiritual world. So it's compared to an ocean. And no one can swim across an ocean. Or even if you try to hold on to a dog's tail, you won't make it. You need a boat. Now the boat has to be a good boat, so if it's a stone boat, 
they don't sink. Mm -hmm. So there are persons who are play, claimed to be gurus who give processes of devotional devotion and various means to realize oneself, but they're not qualified. So they're giving you the stone boat in the form of their knowledge. So they sink and you sink also. But what is the real boat? The real boat is bhakti yoga. So bhakti yoga is explained in the Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. Uh, what is that verse? Last verse in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Yoginam apisarvesam madgate natmanaha stradavan bhajate yomam teme yukta tamomaktaha. So Krishna himself says, out of all the yogas, the highest is bhakti yoga. Because bhakti actually captures, bhakti yamam avajananti, Krishna says. No one can know me except by devotion. And bhakti yoga is the science of pure devotion to Krishna. So that's the boat. And the ocean is the material energy. And so again, even though you have a boat, you have to have someone to direct you across. So the spiritual master, he's been across. He comes back to bring more people across. So he is the qualified captain to sail across the ocean and bring more and more living entities into the boat of devotion. And the favorable winds that make the boat sail are following the rules and regulations that are given in the Shastras. So we, there are things that we have to execute or do, and there's things we have to avoid. So following the rules and avoiding certain things are called vidis and nishedas. Mm -hmm. Vidis means things to do, nishedas means things to avoid. So these are the favorable wins. When you do the right thing and you avoid the wrong thing, then with the power of the boat and the direction of the captain, you can sail across this ocean of material existence and come to the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. So that's the analogy like that. Does that help? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, in the middle of lecture you said, uh, spiritual master is merciful and we should cry for that mercy and we should earn for it. Yeah. So what is the meaning of uh, crying for mercy of spiritual master? All right, if I push your head under water and you're held down there, how long can you stay before you start struggling to get out? <laughs> so, and when you get out, how much is that breath of air? Wow, it's like everything. So that's what it means. We are being crushed by this material energy. Adiyatmika, Adibautika, Adidaivika, miseries of the body, miseries of the mind, miseries that come by other living entities, miseries that come by higher powers. So many. And, you know, we want to do the right thing, we do the wrong thing. <laughs> so we're, we're in a place where there's so much deficiency. So we are in a, what we say, what does it call it? A very difficult situation being in this material world and having a material body. So therefore, in order to rise above these difficulties and come to a real position of devotion to Krishna, there has to be some eagerness there. If there's no eagerness, it's hard to get it. It's called laoyam. Laoyam means intense greed for something. There are people who are greedy for money, people who are greedy for sex life. We have to be greedy for devotion. So these prayers or these expressions of our desire to have it should be coupled with that element of greed, enthusiasm. And that brings the mercy fast. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we, do, we walk around, you know, just 
making some emotional expressions every minute. But when we pray, we should pray from the heart. Pray in sincerity that I need your mercy, I'm begging for your mercy. Without your mercy, what is it? Mukan karochi vachalam, pangu lagate girim, yat kripa karaham made, shigaru dinatarinam. It says, with the mercy of the spiritual master, a lame man can walk, a dumb man can recite beautiful poetry, and a blind man can see the stars. That's the power of a guru, a pure devotee guru. So, and we can see it. There are people in our movement now, they have become from the lowest situation in the material existence and now have become great devotees of the Lord who are chanting, dancing, and helping other people becoming Krishna consciousness. There are so many amazing stories of how coming from the lowest of the low, completely, I mean, I preach in jails, and I meet people who are on the verge of suicide, because being in jail can be very miserable. And somehow, by good fortune, they came across Prabhupada's books. And all of a sudden, after reading the book and learning about what's in the book, their whole life changed. They're chanting and they're preaching to other inmates and they're fixed in their practice of Krishna consciousness. So this is the power of Guru's mercy. Can completely transform someone who is completely unqualified to someone who is more than qualified to worship. That's the power of a spiritual master. Because it's Krishna's mercy. He's carrying that. It's not his, but he carries it. So therefore, to beg for it means to really want it. <laughs> If I say to you, uh, give me something to eat, you might just listen and do something else. But if I tell you, give me something to eat, I'm really hungry. But then you might still not get it. If I say, all right, I'm dying, I'm starving, please give me something to eat. You might get the message then. <laughs> so the eagerness that we express our desire for bhakti brings about the mercy. Hmm. We want it. Anything else? <laughs> yes. Uh, the microphone's coming. Class has ended. Oh, <laughs> thousand questions. I, I have one answer. I have one answer for your thousand questions. I have one answer for your thousand questions. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Someone asked Prabhupada a question. Prabhupada said, "Just chant Hare Krishna." And the answer will come. <laughs> it's not just a cliche, it works. <laughs> Chen Hare Krishna, the answers will come. Thank you very much. Shiva <laughs> Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.
तो आइए हम महाराज को धन्यवाद देते हैं चंद्रमौली स्वामी महाराज को जिन्होंने इतनी अच्छी तरह से हमें गुरु वंदना गुरु पूजा और गुरु की कृपा और गुरु का हमारे जीवन में स्थान के बारे में समझाया तीन बार हरि बोल बोल के